councillors, um, there's been some developments over the lunch hour. The first one is that we're starting at 9am tomorrow on deliberations. We will be starting on page 7 of the draft Ashburton Domain Development Plans Summary of Feedback. So the first topic up will be, and we're doing it issue by issue, First topic up will be overall aim of the plan, and we have a legal opinion given to me by the Chief Executive, Tom Philippa, and there is, do you want to get the words right or will I? There is no legal, you can get the words right, there's no legal, no legal, that, that's right, man. no legal um, law that says we can go into public and speak. So the, so it'll be held in public. So the deliberations tomorrow will be in public meeting. Because uh, under the Local Government Act, there is no reason to exclude the, the public that we can see. Therefore, they will be uh, open to the public. Questions on the timing? One councillor is going to be an hour late. You are leaving at 10 to 11. Do you want us to start at half past eight? No, it's advertised. No, okay, it's advertised. Start at nine. Okay. Yes, um, Councillor Cameron. Just to remind you, um, Mr Chair, that I am leaving at about quarter to one, so maybe like quarter to nine. So that's a conundrum for me. When do I have to have the meeting done by? Uh, 10 to 11 or quarter past one? <laughs> well, whenever. <laughs> about 16 minutes to one o'clock. Right, got you one. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, councillors. Now we move on to the first submission for this afternoon, and it's in the name of the New Zealand Disc Golf Association, Christchurch Disc Golf Club, Paul Deacon and Polly Hill, and the submission numbers are pages 124 and 195. Um, Paul and Polly, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, my name is Paul Deacon and I am the chairman of the... I'm um, sorry, Paul. Order, please, councillors. Paul, you might like to start again. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us, first of all, uh, this afternoon. Um, my name is Paul Deacon and I am chairman of two uh, incorporated societies. One is the Christchurch Disc Golf Club Incorporated and the other is the New Zealand Disc Golf Association Incorporated. It's no accident that I am chairman of both uh, organisations because uh, Christchurch and Canterbury have the fastest growing and largest disc golf community in the country. Um, uh, I'm here with Polly Hill who is the local champion and I'm going to invite her to talk first and then I'll talk more generally about disc golf in New Zealand and why we think uh, the Ashburton Domain is ideal park for disc golf. Um, I'll just flag that we were invited to speak for 15 minutes and allow five minutes for Q&A. We're aiming more for 10 minutes speaking and 10 minutes Q&A. So I'll now hand over to Polly. Hi, I'm uh, Polly, and I would just like to thank you all for reviewing the submission. Um, I moved to Ashburton in January this year to work as a solicitor at Argyle Welsh Finnegan, and I found that after a long day, I wanted some sort of outlet that I could go and do, and I found it difficult to find something apart from running that was free and accessible, and I thought, why not have a disc golf course in the domain? Um, it's been very successful in other areas, and I've played it down in Queenstown, Wanaka. Um, I'm originally from Christchurch, so I've played it a lot in Christchurch as well. Um, the domain is perfect for this. It's um, With the disc golf course, we're able to move things around the outside so that we don't interfere with anything else that um, would be happening. Um, Ashburton is a strong community that would benefit from something like this, and I have talked to several people, not only at work, but outside of work, that would encourage this idea as well. Um, just due to the recent events of COVID, it's actually quite COVID friendly. I know that sounds weird, but it's a non-contact sport and so it might encourage people to get out in the community a little bit more. 
Uh, it can be played all year round, especially on a nice morning. It's it's the perfect time, um, winter or summer. Um, it lasts forever, really. There's no upkeep to this. Once the course is installed, that's it. You can mow around the goals. You can mow around the tees. There's no disruption in that sense. Um, and it, yeah, like I said, it doesn't encroach on other activities that are happening in the domain. And in our submission, we've focused quite a lot on health and safety um, and taken into account other things that might be going on in the domain. Um, and most of all, it encourages people to use the domain and to stay in Ashburner to do that so that they're not having to go outside. Uh, it brings in revenue with possible tournaments. And um, yeah, I just think it would be great. I'll pass on to Paul to go into the specifics a little bit more. Uh, thank you. Um, before I, I speak, I'd just like to move that on this lovely spring day that the hearing be moved to the Ashburton domain. <laughs> uh, uh, under your lovely 150-year-old trees. Uh, but anyway, moving on. Um, I'm interested to know how many of you have actually played disc golf? One, two. And those of you who haven't played, uh, it, raise your hand if you're familiar with disc golf. Okay, no worries. Um, that's typical. Uh, this is what this is what we th what we th throw. Uh, the rules are very similar to traditional ball golf, which is to throw the disc into a basket in as few throws as possible from from a tee. Um, the difference is that the, the 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 fairways are much generally much shorter, and that the game is played much quicker, uh, and it's easier to learn. Um, right. Uh, I'm going to start by just talking about disc golf in New Zealand G generally. Uh, we have 47 courses in New Zealand, 23 of those are in the South Island. Four or f five years ago, that was four or five courses in the South, South Island. Um, there's about 20,000 uh, 20, players in the country. Um, two thirds of those are in the South Island uh, for historical reasons. Uh, that means on a per capita basis, there's about seven times as many disc golfers already in the South Island than in, than in the North. We've got a compound annual growth rate of at least 30 or 40 percent, uh, and that's likely to be sustained. And based on what's happened overseas in other countries, we confidently expect to get something like 200,000 to 300,000 active players in the country. Uh, that's about 4 percent of the population. Uh, most of those players uh, will be people who play no other sport. Um, to give you an example of the sort of thing that's happening at the moment, uh, in uh, Waterloo Business Park in Christchurch recently, a course appeared without our uh, even knowing about it. It was put in there by the business park for the work-life balance of the employees of their clients uh, to assist with uh, employee retention. Uh, in Invercargill, an uh, aged care home recently put in some baskets into their grounds, and they're already heavily used by their residents, uh, great for their, their health. Um, a school in Auckland, a middle school, is uh, in, uh, putting in a course uh, for, their, for their pupil, pupils. Um, the benefits of disc golf are many. Physical health, it's, uh, you don't have to be super fit, you just have to be fit enough. Uh, our old, you can play from knee high to a grasshopper to old. Our oldest member is 80 years old, and he's been known to beat me. Uh, he lives in Invercargill. Uh, it's e easy, it's aerobic, it's low impact. It uses the whole body. Uh, it's good for flexibility and keeping the body limber. Um, mental health, quite important. Uh, I know of four cases already just in the South Island, two in Christchurch, two, in, two down south where all guys, uh, by chance, uh, where they credit disc golf with turning, turning around their mental health problems, typically uh, depression. Um, and um, social well-being, it's a very sociable game. Uh, people talk to each other naturally, so they talk also to bystanders who are curious. And it's very good for people who are socially impaired, for example, if they're deaf or if they're on the autism spectrum, uh, it's easy. Uh, sociable activity in an outdoor setting and it's easy for them to get involved with other people. Uh, youth delinquency, the game was invented in 1975 in California in the middle of the 
uh, California counterculture, and the design of the game had the specific aim of designing a pastime that would appeal to the rebellious youth of the and disaffected youth of the time. So, as well as being a wholesome family sport that lots of people just love and get basically addicted to, um, it also tends to appeal to uh, youngsters who, for example, would never be seen anywhere near the school rugby team or school rowing team. Uh, uh, and uh, it's uh, good for parks. We, we've seen it ourselves. Uh, you put disc golf into a park, you see a reduction in littering, a reduction in loitering, a reduction in vandalism, and quite important, it improves the safety of the park for all users because the disc golfers are using the fringe areas of the park where people don't frequently go. Um, there's a tourism benefit, um, mostly domestic, um, as well as people coming here just to play. Um, it will be an ideal course for a major annual tournament which would attract 100 or more uh, players from all over the country who will be staying in, in Ashburton and obviously eating and dining here as well. As, as well. Um, the domain is very well suited. I'd say it's one of the iconic t uh, parts in New Zealand in terms of its suitability for disc golf. It's got pretty much everything we want, easy, easy access, lovely mature trees, good parking, um, it's easy for people with impaired mobility to walk around the course. Um, it's a lovely place to hang out. It's got toilets, water, uh, plenty of interest in the course. And very importantly, it's in a residential area. Um, we've discovered that uh, if you really want to grow the game, you have to actually put courses in residential areas. And um, especially it's the case that uh, if you want to increase particip participation of women and girls, you need to put the courses where they live. Uh, our experience is that women and girls won't cross town to play, but they will play in a local park. Um, and also, looking at your schools, there's four schools within very easy distance of the domain. There's another four not far away, and that's what that, so that two-thirds of the schools in your district would be able to use uh, the park. Um, also, it's a multi-use activity. This might be a new concept uh, to mayor and councillors, but essentially, um, uh, disc golf, share, by the rules of the game, shares space with uh, other users of the park. So if there are joggers, cyclers, dog walkers, picnickers, sunbathers, whatever, they have absolute priority over the disc golf. That's the rules of the game. So I'd like to stop there, and I'd like to invite uh, questions, please. <laughs> so we'll uh, we'll do that. Uh, Roger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, um, how long is a course? Is there a sort of a designated length, like a golf course? Uh, well, there's that's a bit. Of how long is a piece of string? Uh, qu qu question. So um, that we, it's traditional to um, do either nine hole or eighteen hole courses, following the example of ball golf, but that's not uh, ne necessary. Um, in terms of the length of the hole, holes or fairways, um, that's determined much more by the character of the park than by the, the designer of the, of the course. Um, and uh, I believe we're at, uh, pr the proposal is standing at the moment at tw 22 holes at the moment. But that's, that's really a how long is a piece of string question. There's no fixed. Uh, we might put in a course in Christchurch as, so as short as um, six. And Hot. where, and a supplementary question, if I may, where, where in our domain would you envisage it being located? Um, hang on. Uh, uh, um, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll ha hand over to Polly. But sorry, you, it's basically can I suggest you that you go to page 135, oh, 134, sorry. and then just so, scroll. Okay, okay thank you. Maps yep, forward. yep. So essentially, it do, it doesn't use the the areas that are used for sports pitches. It used the wooded and fringe areas of the park that are the least used areas of the park. Yeah. Okay, um, Councillor Lovett. I was just going to ask, um, how how much does, does each of these baskets cost? Are they all different, and and also the height of them, and are they suited for children or adults? Or you have different ones for different heights. Um, they actually weigh, I'm pretty sure, 32 kgs. So they're quite 
it's sturdy, which is good. People can't actually hold it. No, they can be up to like 70 kgs. There's different, there are different specs, uh, <laughs> so it depends how sturdy and vandal proof you want the uh, want it to be. So yeah. they're all the same height, though, aren't they? Yes, it's a standard height. Yeah, so it's friendly for you. It, kids can uh, reach out of the basket as well as adults. Uh, so that's not. Um, basically, kids from five or six upwards can play. <coughs> uh, age sort of two to four, they can start throwing discs. And the cost, you know, what are we looking at per basket? Well, uh, my idea in terms of funding was to include businesses and get one business to sponsor each hole. Mm -hmm. um, it would be maximum a thousand dollars, but I'm looking at the moment about seven seven fifty for each business to sponsor. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Oh, yeah. uh, thanks. I did have a look. I googled it and seen the price of them five hundred dollars, but it must be in US dollars, so you're probably being on. Yeah. Great idea, good initiative. Um, in the domain, there's lots of trees in that, so does it make it um, better having trees around? Or if it was in an open space, would it be better having an open space? Which is preferable? Well, um, it's. Or does it, it not matter? We, no, it does matter. The worst possible disc golf course is completely open okay. because there's absolutely no interest uh, for, for the players. So to have an interesting disc golf course, you need obstacles in the form of mature trees, potentially ponds, changes in eleva elevation, bushes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, because then you have to come up with a cunning plan how you're going to get around that tree uh, or into that green, which is well guarded by trees. Uh, so it's yeah, that's why we're using there the part we proposed. Councillor uh, Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of questions, if I, if I can. The first one is the word, the word Mendo. Why is it on your plan? What does it mean? Sorry, that's a that's a very bad um, disc golf abbreviation. It stands for mandatory. So basically, it's often used where there's a potential safety issue. It's that's. It, it states that you have to go, for example, to the left or right of a particular tree. Okay. All right, so in order that people don't blast down the path. Okay. Other question I've got, um, on a golf course, you normally don't have any walkers. In a domain, you've got walkers but no golfers. Um, you want to have discs in a public park with trees. I can't see those things coming, <laughs> and I'm a big target. Um, so... <laughs> How, how do you see the combination of, of walkers and people crossing the disc? Um, well, um, that's a very good question. Uh, the, main, uh, the main issue is uh, visibility from the shooter, from the thro thrower. Okay, So that's why we've paid, in the design, uh, paid particular attention to the sighting of the tees, so that they can see any possible pedestrians. Uh, in the in the line of line, line of the shot, um, the, by the rules of the game, uh, other users of the park have absolute priority. So the most common are dog dog walkers uh, in a park like yours, um, and uh, so it's mostly very simple because everyone knows that the walker or jogger or cyclist is moving on. We just wait until they're gone on. Uh, there may be very rare uh, cases where the, the group will need a spotter. Someone's done a bad shot and has to come out bl blind, but you, the group organizes so that there's a spotter. So we're never relying on, we're never relying on the pedestrian uh, uh, for the safety. We're relying on the, uh, on, on, on the uh, good sense of the uh, players. And the last one for me. Um, is it you play it in teams or you do it by yourself? I understand from you, you want to go afterward, just walk and throw a disc. Yeah, you can, uh, you can do it as many, with as many people as you like, or you can go by yourself. Uh, I go by myself plenty of times, and I enjoy it just as much as when I go with someone else. It's yeah. just, yeah. Yes, it's basically, you can, it, so you might be playing with yourself, then you're with another disc golfer, so you'll go around with them. Mm. Um, if it's a tournament, people will typically go around in groups of four, because experience has shown that if it's larger, it just slows, slows down. Uh, too much, but you can get. I was in Jelly Park in Christchurch yesterday, which is the busiest course in the country. There were family groups of six or eight going around quite happily. You can also meet quite a lot of people on the course, too. 
it, like the amount of times I've been going around and sort of linked up with someone else that's been um, playing as well. Mm. Yeah, you meet lots of people as well. So. Yeah. Councillor McMillan. Thank you. Um, I have played, uh, well, I called it Frisbee golf, but and it was a long time ago in Canada. Um, but I'm just wondering about the cost. So um, you're going to get 18 businesses to, to sponsor each basket. What other costs there would be? I'm assuming there would have to be kind of like a, a bit of a sign at the start showing you where the course outlay, outlay is. Would that be the only other cost that you would would have in setting it up? Um, well, there's there's um, there's three uh, three main components. There's the baskets which we which we've talked about. So every basket on the course will be the same. There's all, there's a, a tee pad, so normally a paved tee pad. So it's got it's flush to ground level. And it's got it's layered about twenty centimeters deep with sand and gravel and uh, a board around the outside and pavers. So it looks quite it's very uh, it's quite appealing uh, uh, to look at. Uh, also easy to install or remove. Um, and th then of course there's labour, but then there will be cost for s for signage. And the typical course will have at least two signs, possibly more, depending on where the entrances are. Councillor Cameron. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, just a few questions, if I may. Uh, first one is, do people, if they want to be ranked, as you are ranked, do they have to join the Incorporated Society? Like, how do you validate your results otherwise? Or? Uh, there's different. Uh, you, if, you, if you play in a tournament, mm -hmm. then obviously you'll get ranked as a result in that, in that tournament. Mm -hmm. um, there's two different ranking systems in operation in New Zealand. One is the uh, New Zealand tour. Mm -hmm. So if you play, there's about 18 or 20 events on the tour. Uh, if you play in those events, you'll get a rank ranking. And at the end of the year, the top 16 players go into a match play tournament. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is that there's a global association called the PDGA, which stands for the Professional Disc Golf Association, although it's, it's at least 70% amateur. It's misna misnamed. And they do a world worldwide ranking system. So, so yeah. would there be an Ashburton Incorporated Society, Ashburton Disc Golfers Incorporated Society? Is that how that would work, or how would, or just people bowl up and they're not members, they can just use them yeah. as a recreational? Yeah, that's and a then if you wanted to have a competition, yeah. you would organise that. Yeah, that's and do, can local en can I just ask one more question, please? Yeah. Yeah. Can local engineers build the baskets and the nets and things, or do you? How do they get them? How do we get them? Well, New Zealand Disc Golf um, Supplies are uh, the people that have designed the course that we're they giving you. They supply the hardware. Yeah. So you can't get the hardware locally. Um, there's th there is, yes, there's, there's um, it's very expensive to import baskets because of their weight. Mm -hmm. um, there's one manufacturer of baskets in New Zealand, mm -hmm. which is based in Auckland. Their name's RPM. And they make very good baskets. Um, and that, but they, they're, Starting to make baskets in to different spec, mm -hmm. um, um, so the, the, as far as I'm aware, that's the only manufacturer in New Zealand at the moment. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So yeah. that'd be. But source in terms of other questions, no, like 98% of disc golfers are casual and recreation and don't have any affiliation okay. with clubs. And when I've seen them, this is my last question, Mr. Chair. When I see them, they've got spray. They're sprayed around the base, of, so your grass doesn't grow up the, the hardware doesn't grow up the pole, you know, into the netting and things. Is that who does that? Parks and reserves, or who maintains the lawn around the? Um, that's normally left to par parks and reserves because there's no obstacle to them mowing around the base of the basket. There's just a pole going into right. a, in, yeah. into a sleeve, a sleeve in the ground, and normally also the the the, the tees are are flush to the ground, so they don't interfere with that maintenance. We would normally expect a, a, a club to be responsible for the maintenance of the baskets and tees. Um, so at the moment, there's no Ashburton club because the concept is new to Ashburton. Mm -hmm. uh, in time, there may be. Um, if the council sees fit uh, in the interim, the Christchurch Disc Golf, Disc Golf Club, which, by the way, has just applied to be a registered 
charity, mm -hmm. um, we'd be happy to take ownership of the um, uh, of the bath facilities and be responsible for that aspect of the maintenance of the course. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, Councillor uh, Rawlinson. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. I think this is a great idea. That part of my question just been answered, and it was around the, the baskets. Do you have to put a post in the ground, or can they be, if they were allowed to be, attached to a tree? Uh, what's the norm? Um, the, the, the norm is to have a, a sleeve in, in, in the ground into which the basket is, is put right. and it bolts or padlock in a, in a relatively secure way to help prevent uh, vandalism. We do have vandalism, it's fairly low, uh, but it does occur occasionally. So are, these, are they a round or a supermarket basket shape or what are, are they? Are they? Well, the basket is dark brown in colour on the ground, and it goes up like that. It's it's round, and then that has uh, a belt on the top, and has a protective frame on the other side. It's heavy bamboo, and it's sort of designed to trap the dirt. Great, thank you. Okay, um, I have a question from the chair, but first of all, I've got to find out the relevant information. So I'm asking Sue Newman. A question because she seems to be about the only golfer I know in the room. A number of years ago I played golf and um, had gin shots but I also hit the ball on the other fairways. What's the call, Sue, when the ball is lining up, the golf ball is lining up to hit someone? There's a call. Four. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So but my question is to the submitters, what's the call when a disc is being thrown off course and may hit someone? <laughs> Whoops. Um, it's the s it's the same essentially. Four, oh, four. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, now the other part of the question is, um, Polly, you're actually asking for permission to set this up, and if you get permission, you handle everything else. Have I got that right? Yes. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you very much for presenting something new for Ashford. Thank you. Um, I'll just add to that last question. Um, it, it, it's customary in Christchurch that we might ask the uh, council, or in Christchurch it would be actually the local community boards, to pay for signage, but that's up to them. Yeah. Ethnic community board. Yeah, because it's a, it's usually a council sign. That's all. Yeah. Not not a club sign. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we now have um, New Zealand Trees for Bees Research, Ray Butler, and the submission is on page 197. Ray, would you like to come forward and present your submission, please? 197. Do you want me to start? Or? Yep. Yep. Kia ora, everyone. Um, thank you for hearing me. Um, my submission, I just wanted to read on it because it's probably not new to you or anything, um, planting trees for bees, but I just thought it was a good opportunity for me to emphasise to you more that um, if you're going to do some planting or around the domain that maybe you would want to put it in a theme. Um, basically, I thought straight away when I heard about the hub and the re-jigging of the domain, I thought um, what a great opportunity for the, to promote our pollinators because here in Ashburton, of course, you all know uh, we have the rare uh, unique butterfly, the Rapara copper butterfly, and we're also the largest small seed production um, area in New Zealand doing forage and vegetable seeds. Um, your main industry here in Ashburton um, is uh, seed production, and in turn that's, you've got a lot of service industries coming off that. Um, reportedly, Mid Canterbury is a third uh, of the, produces the third of the world's carrots um, and radish seeds. So they're very, very reliant on pollinators. So not, on one hand, we have rare butterflies, and we also really um, we need pollinators. Honeybees, of course, are the main source of pollinators, but there's also biodiversity um, insects that are required as well, which a lot of researchers are working on. 
Um, but our pollinators, um, they rely on the environment and for one reason or other, especially in this area, the environment's changed on them. Uh, they're not only becoming extinct, but they're also finding it hard to um, find the sufficient nutri nutrients to survive. Uh, with the biosecurity and everything, a few diseases are coming in. We're looking at the honeybee. We have the varroa mite. The varroa mites here. Um, it's not actually the varroa mite that is actually killing the bees. It's all the viruses that it transfers onto the bees. Um, and once again, the nutrition. If the more nutrition we can give the bees, uh, the more, the better they can handle this. We also have pesticides. Um, that also affect their survival. So my key aim was, I thought, well, if you're going to have a central hub, um, you know, the logo, it's our place. Well, it's our place, but it's our um, pollinator's paradise. So if we could educate not only um, the farmers, but the general public, um, we could actually help to actually plant again for the pollinators because not all trees or shrubs, not all flowers yield nectar and pollen. Um, so therefore it's you've got to be careful what you're planting. You're not necessarily um, being beneficial to your insects. Um, trees for Bees is a charity trust and it's been going for 10 years. It's had sustainable farming fund. It first started, it was um, instigated with federated farmers and they started talking to the beekeepers and asking them what bees did the um, bees forage from. And from there they collected samples of nectar and pollen from all the trees. And it's taken them 10 years to build up a whole catalogue of uh, not only identifying the trees, but actually grading the pollen and the nectar. So not, and because not all pollen's good, like pine pollen is less in nutrients than say flax. So then they've identified that and they've also identified what times of the year regionally these trees uh, flower. So therefore they've also created for each region a flowering calendar. So you can actually plant all year round to getting a certain amount of nutrition for not just your bees but for um, other insects. Uh, the same information that they've gathered can actually also be used for, you know, the butterflies and um, other other insects. Um, so my vision was, as soon as I heard about it, I got very excited and rushed around and looked at the aviary and, and the cricket grounds, and I was like, oh my god, yes, you could um, definitely plant, um, do some planting here, and you could have placards and so, um, teaching the public and also the farmers and everyone, any interested parties, what actually um, plants and everything was sufficient, and you could have placards and right around. And then I was like, oh my God, the cricket club room, that would be amazing, because you could also turn that into a, an information centre if you're going to have a cafe there or something. And I'm looking at, you can look at what they're doing overseas. Um, in San Diego Zoo, they've got a great insect um, <coughs> section, uh, insect house there that's actually very informative about different insects and things. And I thought, well, we can, um, you can ha talk about um, the biodiversity uh, of um, insects. You need good insects and bad insects. Um, so then you can, if you've got the bad insects, that ha they help with the compost and they become part of the life cycle and the in the food chain, you can explain about um, weeds and planting, pesticides, and you could also um, be helping with research. You could actually, before you're planting here in, you, in the domain, you could do a study on what insects and pollinators are there, and then carry on, carry on the research as you're going to how actually the planting is performing. But then I heard about the, the bowling club people not wanting to move, so I really don't want to get caught in sort of saying, yes, I think we should have some sort of educational tool there. Maybe somewhere within the domain would be actually sufficient. 
um, I'll leave you guys to decide on that one because I ended up um, being very excited about putting my submission in and talked to the wrong person and didn't realise it was such an issue here in Ashburton. Um, but um, my other thing was um, it would be an educational tool um, for horticulturists and it would also attract um, schools could come along and uh, learn different things from it. The agricultural industry could use it as an educational tool and most importantly entomologists. Um, we can also draw on overseas not only the San Diego Zoo but um, there's a pollinator park that's been started in uh, Gulf in Canada and that's 456 hectares that has a lot of people and they've built that on landfill and um, they're actually working with a lot of volunteers and they actually you know, do things like compost carpets and putting seeds in it and things. So there's a whole lot of projects that I feel if you had a theme going, um, you could just you know, maybe carry it on, whether it be um, voluntary or not. And also uh, Rawiki Domain in New Brighton, that's 1.7 hectares and they've actually also just been planting for native birds and butterflies. But yeah, that was pretty much, I was just wanting to emphasise um, where my submission was coming from and as a, um, a, a area that's so reliant on pollinators, you know, if you would consider whenever you're doing any planting, planting for you know, pollinators, basically. Any questions? Questions, Councillor? Councillors? Questions? Councillor O'Brien? Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you for this. Uh, excuse um, me. Oh, um, I heard you say yes, Mr. Chair, but then I didn't hear you. Can you please arrange your microphone accordingly? I can about a hand away. That's it. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> nailed it. I nailed it properly. Just listen. Um, Trees for bees. Yes. Is the name of, of the group you're, you're uh, you know, you, yeah, you're presenting it here. Let's say yeah. that way. Um, but you talk about a lot of small plants. Can you give me about 10 trees what you could plant in the domain for the bees? Oh, see, I knew somebody asked me. I'm, yeah, I'm actually a queen breeder. Um, and a, <laughs> I produce honeybees and I've got my ambassador hat on for trees for bees. Um, straight away off the top of my head, even though I'm a beekeeper, I'm not great with trees, um, names, but five finger, uh, lace bird, but la lace bark, they're high performers. Um, there's, oh, we've actually cat um, yeah, I haven't done the work, it's Linda <laughs> has. Yeah, yeah, um, but they've also categorised them in natives as well as exotics. So um, you've got, yeah, lace bark, five finger, and I forgot to bring my pamphlet, sorry, but yeah, it's all on the website. Yeah, no, sorry, yeah. I was, I yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I'd like what I would like the council to do, with, uh, or the domain, use that information that you know, they've they've done. They also do um, planting. They do help with planting. Oh, you all work with landscapers. Councillor Latham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your submission, Ray. Um, it sounds pretty exciting. I I think. Have you spoken to Trots Gardens? Because I know they have a program up there in, in broad terms, pretty similar to what I understand you were just saying to me. So if it doesn't work in our domain, all I'm suggesting is perhaps you should have a word with them because they're putting education facilities in for children to understand birds, bees, butterflies and uh, right. things like that. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have um, uh, been put in touch with trots, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, further questions? Ray, thank you very much for coming in. No worries. Thank you. I have a question of Mr David Fisher. Would you mind starting 10 minutes early, sir? Thank you. Um, Dave is with the um, Ashburton Sports Turf Trust. The page number in your submission book is page 32, councillors. Oh, okay, down, we'll wait for that. Yep. Maybe better to refer to it. Okay. Sorry. Um, can you turn on your um, microphone? Uh, right hand button. 
And if you can turn this speaker around and be that far away, it would be ideal. Move the speaker closer. Sorry, 32. Floor is yours, David, when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm submitting on behalf of the uh, Ashburton Sports Turf Trust, uh, who own, uh, built, owns, and leases out the artificial hockey service, and it's customary called just the turf, uh, and also includes a small practice area and the pavilion. Um, trust is a charitable trust, registered with charity services, five trustees that are listed there. Mick Canterbury Hockey leases the facility from the trust and responsible for the day to day maintenance of the facility and the long-term maintenance is the responsibility of the trust and that includes the replacement as the turf wears out. The current turf was replaced in 2012 so soon after the earthquakes we got a bonus uh, as you may well remember from a previous presentation um, through uh, insurance proceeds. Uh, so the last um, 10 to 20 years so the, the current turf may need replacing over the next two to five, seven years. It's, it's a bit unknown. Mid Canary Hockey itself, um, as the tenant, is in um, a good healthy position with player numbers growing from around 500 in 2010 to 665 last year. Haven't got this year's figures, but I'll, to be honest, expect them to be down like every other sport. And then we hope they'll grow again. And, and that's our expectations that um, with the pro programs and strategies we have in place, um, that's sort of a bit mid Canary hockey hat on, uh, that those numbers will continue to grow through a coaching development officer and, and um, a presence in the schools. The Trust entered into a deal lease with the Ashburn District Council on 31 October 1996 uh, to lease the land when the turf was built um, with a payment of an annual rental. This deal lease had a 20 year term so it's fairly obvious that the lease has expired and we have had some discussions with the chief executive regarding the expiry uh, and its renewal. Uh, so looking at the draft domain development plan, um, I've listed a number of areas where the, the turf comes up. I don't really go through all of them, but it's certainly shown on the existing site plan, uh, hockey pitch with pavilion, uh, existing activities and facilities mentions hockey uh, and it's shown on the map. The uh, fencing around the turf is recognised. Uh, in the 30 year plan, uh, the turf's not included in any, any of the highlighted areas where development projects are proposed, apart from the walkway to the turf from Elizabeth Street. The turf's included in the sports precinct. No hockey, no photos of hockey, which I was slightly disappointed about. I thought it might have shown there. The future circulation shows the pedestrian path uh, from Elizabeth Street and the proposed path going round the side of the turf. Future development projects, there, there's no development projects indicated for the area occupied for the turf apart from perhaps from a possible relocation of the bowling club. And there are a number of areas, a number of items mentioned on the map that are near the turf um, that are of interest to us uh, as a trust, the uh, waterway enhancements, the bridges, the West Street entry and car park upgrade, the potential bowling club move and the lighting upgrade of paths come to those shortly, but the, uh, the, the one of the main ones uh, um, that does affect us and is of interest is the West Street car park uh, entry and upgrade. And it, it does mention that um, that car park would be uh, available for overflow parking when events are held, such as large hockey tournaments. So that sounds good. So when we looked through that as a trust, we thought uh, in, uh, reviewing all those items that are mentioned in the plan that it appears that the hockey turf is an integral part of the domain 
uh, on the basis of that. There appears to be no intention to shift hockey turf from the main. So that's uh, how, what we get out of, uh, out of the plan we've seen, and, and if that's the case, we're happy with the turf trust. Trees are very happy with that. However, the uh, renewal of the lease needs to be actioned to give certainty of tenure and the conditions of that tenure. That's, uh, we've got to get that organised sooner rather than later. So items in the domain development plan that trust are supportive of and would encourage completion as they'd be an enhancement to the turf and its use. Uh, waterway enhancements, so the repair and strengthening of any of the pond hinges where they become worn out on any waterways next to and near the turf are fully supported. Bridge enhancements, there's a bridge next to the turf, so uh, the trust are fully supportive of, of anything done there. West Street entry and car park upgrade, um, that's going to formalise a second vehicular entrance and creation of car park on an area previously used as a netball court, that's fully supported. This will take congestion away from Elizabeth Street and certainly assist when there are large events along with a picnic area for overflow parking. So the trust are uh, definitely behind that. And the lighting upgrade, the upgrade the lighting on the path providing access from Elizabeth Street uh, is certainly supported. Um, any improvement there will help users and assist with safety, uh, particularly in the evening because there's quite a bit of evening use of the turf, as you'll be aware. Items not in the domain plan to be considered. Um, at the eastern end of the turf, there's a, um, a lot of trees and shrubs that are high and overgrown. Um, and the foliage from these impacts on the condition of the turf. We get a lot of rubbish basically yeah, coming onto the turf. Um, that needs to be cleaned. We actually have been or in the process of cleaning at the moment. It basically it's a bit like compost really. Uh, and it's not solely from those trees, it does come from Warrant Ave as well. Uh, the trust suggests that the trees at the other end are, are removed and perhaps replaced with something more appropriate to the site and won't cause issues to the turf. The area between the turf uh, and the tennis uh, asked, the, asked the question, would this area be available for extensions to the turf? For example, another playing surface or extended practice area. Now another a full playing service wouldn't fit there, that's uh, too that's too small for that, but um, could get a half turf there. Um, and with our expectation of player numbers growing, um, that would be useful. Um, and certainly the children's games are on smaller turfs, so that would allow more children's games to be played there if that would if that could fit later on. Uh, and also the structure uh, of hockey is possibly changing to uh, smaller team size um, and, and different structure of games and it's really just uh, what's happening in, in the current environment and in the future. It's just, you know, sports have got to move the times uh, and be relevant to the current and future generations. Assistance with turf replacement, uh, the turf wears out and requires maintenance um, between 10 and 20 years um, in the city, probably 10 years because they get a lot more use. Uh, here we're certainly hoping for 15 years, although we're pushing it with the current turf. Other councils around New Zealand uh, allow funding for hockey turf car uh, car carpet replacement and or new hockey turf development. And the trust asks that there is allowance in the domain plan for assistance with turf replacement. Uh, the Ashburton District Council proposes a 50% of the development of sports grounds around EA Networks Centre and perhaps funding on a similar basis could be provided for expected hockey, hockey turf base and carpet replacement. Items in the domain management plan the trust is not supportive of. Um, relocation of the Ashburton bowl, of the bowling club. Uh, turf sees no need to shift it from its current site. The plan suggests relocation of the picnic area. If this were to happen, Trust considers that this could add further pressure to parking on Elizabeth Street and the new parking area proposed. Uh, 
the trust notes that the plan isn't allocated no cost for the, to the relocation if it does go ahead, and this seems a little unfair as well. The plan also notes that the area of the turf could, uh, sorry, the area, well, the current area of the turf could be a site for relocation of the bowling club if the turf, if the turf, when hockey were to re relocate to EA Network sports site. And at this stage, there's no intention to relocate the turf to its, to, from its current site. The cost is too expensive to set up new facilities, um, and we would need considerable assistance from the council to do that. Just a general comment about the uh, overall costs. Um, I don't really want to go into that here. And the other last major item that's some concern to us is the cricket pavilion upgrade and other domain buildings enhancement. And the trust considers it's unfair that these buildings are upgraded at rate par expense. Other sports users of the domain, hockey, tennis, bowls, have constructed and maintained their buildings at their own expense with no assistance from the district council. If this building upgrading was to go ahead, the trust asked for similar assistance to be provided uh, for maintenance and replacement of the turf and buildings on the turf. Why are the users of the cricket pavilion and other buildings to be upgraded allowed to get away with out contributing to the cost of upgrade? Thank you for receiving this information. Councillor, I love it. I was just going to ask with future development, if your numbers keep growing and you need an, another turf, could you work between a new turf down at EA and leaving one in the domain working between two sites? If there's not enough room in the domain to put another one up, taking up too much grass area, do you see yourself doing that, having a professional one in a um, I'll be honest, uh, it hasn't been talked about. Uh, our probably our, our end goal is to have two turfs. That would be wonderful if we did, because that means our numbers uh, are, are good. Um, but it, I'm certainly thinking it would be possible to work with two, but um, it's not efficient to work with two different sites. Yep, Councillor Rawlinson. Councillor Cameron. I just had the same question along those lines. But, um, is your, your turf, because I've been there a few times to watch my niece play, is the turf uh, for the number of, do you have enough capacity for the number of players so far? You're not short on space at the moment? Not at the moment, no. no, no. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Rawlinson. <coughs> Thank you, David. I've got two questions. The first one um, is around tournaments. Is it correct that if you had a second turf that you would be able to attract bigger tournaments through shooting? Uh, th yeah, all the turfs around New Zealand are rated, and, and um, I, I think the rating, I'm not absolutely sure, is having having the two turfs and, and the facilities that go with them. Um, and uh, having the two turfs, you can get um, the tournaments that were available. We had one of the school kids from, I think it was Mayfield or Lismore, enlighten us that I think she was a keen hockey player that if, if we had another turf we'd get a higher level of tournament. So, But my second question was around the parking, um, partially disabled for hockey is a problem isn't it? Um, I've got friends who would love to go and watch hockey on a Saturday but that gate at Elizabeth Street is always locked and they simply can't go and watch because they can't get in can't drive their car across the, the domain from um, Walnut Avenue. So is there a way that we can get around that at all? Or do you see a sort of, or does that gate need to be left? It seems to be a bone of contention. I had to go and present prizes for the under-16 tournament last year, and that has been shut all week. And all the poor people had to walk and pull up all the streets down to park for that tournament. question is around that entry. Could we open for people to get nearer to the pavilion, but particularly the elderly? Uh, well, I would think when the uh, um, that West car park was developed, it could, could be uh, incorporated in there. I, I suppose it's still uh, a reasonable distance away. 
but I wonder what that was developed, whether that would cover your disabled parking. And the second area the, uh, that comes off that is the pick something can be done in there, but it depends what our savings, doesn't it? Okay, uh, Mr Mayor. Thanks, Mr Chairman. When the um, EA Networks Centre was being, there was discussions with all the sports users around and who wanted to relocate Theo, there and Hockey was involved in that um, discussion. And if I remember back, the discussion then was we need to renew the turf one more time and then we could prob probably, possibly relocate. Is that still the case today, or has that th those thoughts changed? Uh, once again, uh, we, we probably haven't done a full review of it and, and sat down. And um, I think the cost is getting prohibitive to set up those facilities again um, on a new site. Uh, but it all depends on what systems we have. And the cost is the main reason. It's, it's over a million dollars, well over a million dollars to. Um, to start again, um, and that would be a big ask for us. But if you've got the numbers, it, it can work, can't it? So, um, so it, it is a possibility. But uh, it, it's that being well over a million dollars that's the, the is the problem. It, but you're, but uh, you're quite right. We, uh, you know, we're not uh, against going, um, but it's going to take a lot of planning and funding to get there. Thank you. Answer this question for me, but um, so you said the lease is expi expired in 2016. Correct. So I was just wondering why it hasn't been renewed. Is there a reason, or is it? Uh, is it second tip. Yes. Oh. Uh, we'll fo we'll follow that reminder up. I do recall meeting uh, with David uh, some months ago now, uh, and it, it was the exact state of that lease is not. Forefront of my mind, so I will uh, explore that. We're not un unhappy that it hasn't been, but <laughs> but we would be unhappy if um, we didn't get any input and and, and perhaps the, the terms. Well, some of the terms need to change and be updated, but uh, we need to be careful about that renewal. Yeah. Okay, councillors, any further questions? David, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. And I call on um, Mid Canterbury Cricket Association. Would you mind being early, or uh, all your members not here yet? I adjourn for five minutes.
Okay, everyone, I uh, reconvene and I have pleasure in calling forward the Mid Canterbury Cricket Association, Mark Mendicott and Mike Southby. I'd like to come forward, gentlemen. Um, the microphones um, work better if you're that far away because people out there on the airwaves like to hear you. Okay, so if you turn your mics on. Hit the right button, I think it is. Thank you. The floor is yours when you're ready. Okay, yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Mackay. Just first apologies from Geoffrey Nash, who's the chairman right. of McHenry Cricket, so unable to make it today due to work commitments. Um, <coughs> we've got obviously our submission, which has been, been circulated. I guess um, the main thing from our perspective. It's, it's purely around, a, obviously, around a cricket perspective and the impacts that, that the proposed development plan may or may have on cricket. So there's there's two main two main aspects, I suppose, without um, probably doing it in order. The first one is in the um, page 20 of the plan, which is associated with the sort of north eastern corner where the new access road comes in. One of the fields seems to have disappeared, um, which is one of the one one of the artificial current artificial pitches that we use that is used a lot heavily used by juniors, and that may just be a drafting issue, hopefully, or because we, you know we we would certainly be opposed to that. And with the posi provision position of the road, which again may only be schematic, um, it will impact on. The one field which says it's relocated is fine, but it will impact on the position of the other one that's missing would also need to be relocated as well. And uh, they're both artificial pitches. So it's the one that's on that, it's shown on that plan, but it's not shown on the one on the sort of dotted one that the road goes halfway through. That's missing, it's missing off that, that sheet, which was the one on page 20. Where the big put the big marker pen is, so obviously we wouldn't be in favour of uh, losing a losing a pitch, given that they, those one of the artificial ones which are heavily used, particularly by juniors, most Saturday Saturday mornings and Saturday afternoons, and as it is, we we're kind of struggling for numbers of those, and we're possibly looking to um, potentially put some more of them in if we can. So I guess that's that's one aspect of our. Of our, uh, of our submission, um, the other the other one is concerning the the oval and the sorry the too close or not close enough <coughs> the oval and, and particularly the western side uh, where the where the, the existing pond is there, um, which is the pond under the big trees down the western side. Um, to be, it's painful <laughs> for us from credit, and it, you know we've seen that it has um, very current currently anyway, very little of any kind of amenity value. The banks are all falling down, and trees and in it, and all sorts of rubbish that are in there, um, and there doesn't appear to be any. Pro there's new pathways shown on the other side, which. Go out where the where the pathway goes now between that pond and the croquet and all that, but on that side there doesn't seem to be anything done other than the generic uh, waterway enhancements, and within the current um, proposals or the current sort of indicative things that are shown as waterway enhancements, none of them would help our cause. It would make it worse probably <laughs> in terms of balls going into the pond, um, and that's. You know that I guess that's the issue there. It's you know, 150 bucks a pop every time one goes in. You know, particularly at, at senior representative level, the umpires you know want another one, a new one. Um, so, with I guess w what we would like to see is uh, well, I'd like to know what what if all the way enhancements meant fill it in, that would be fantastic, but. Um, just really that section from the, from
from where the existing path is. The, the section of concern is that piece from where the existing pathway goes down to the, I suppose, the Phillips Street Bridge. Um, we recognise that the piece on the other side, on the eastern side, there, there's a piece there, but there's much less of an issue, and it obviously it has a lot more amenity value already anyway now than, than what that piece down that western side does. Um, yeah, so I, I don't, I'm not sure what, yeah, as I say, what the enhancement in, involves there, but there's some very large trees there, um, which are great, fantastic. You know, provide a lot of shelter and, and a good value, and, and just about everybody that comes to the domain comments on what a fantastic setting it is to play cricket on that oval. Whether they're the um, people from within our zone that we play, or overseas teams or visiting teams, everybody comments on that. And and just about without fail, they tend to also comment on the that stretch of water, particularly if a ball goes in there. Um, I guess you know that, so yeah, preferably for us it would be fill it in, but if not, if there's some other thing that could be done in terms of fencing or something like that <coughs> to mitigate that risk, that would be great. Um, I, see, I noticed just the other day up in the, what is the northwestern corner, in, the, in behind the trees up there, there's a sort of a, what I imagine would be a relatively cheap sort of fence, there's a deer post and chicken netting fence along there, so you know, even something like that, on obviously on this side of the pond and under the trees, um, would, if, if anyone hits it over top of a 1.8 metre fence at that point, it's a fairly good hit and it probably deserves to be put in the pond. But, um, and that would, you know, we, we do put up practice string up practice nets and all sorts of old nets and bits and pieces along there for each game but it's a bit painful and it, it does stop the majority of them of the bulls but uh, it doesn't stop all of them um, but if if we didn't have to do that for each game it, it would be great and it would and, and a, yeah so I think <coughs> and I haven't read the submission since we wrote it for a while but I think in guts but those were probably the two the two points that, that we raised that, in particular, uh, how the plan impacts on cricket. Uh, Paul, the landscape architect involved with the plan. Um, there's a slight conceit on there that the access road and the current field, uh, there's a slight overlap there. And m my gut feel is that the field could remain, it would just need to be shifted and the pitch would need to shift with it. So I think you can still fit two there, uh, but you would need to relocate the pitch or that to make it fit. Once, once the road goes in. Would you like to comment further after that answer, Mike? Uh, no, as long as there's still two there. Yeah. <laughs> it moved, yeah. Did yeah, you say it was different? Diff the, obviously, that, I don't know if that's a later. That's a different different plan to the one that was in the thing that was just missing off. I wish they were all that easy. I wish they were all that easy. <laughs> Okay, we'll fill the pond in and we'll be happy. We'll, we'll go happy. <laughs> no, no, we're going to train a duck. <laughs> um, Councillor Rawlinson. Thank you. And thanks for your presentation. Just regarding that waterway, um, I don't think there's a lot of water goes through there, is there? But would piping that piece to carry the water still be a solution? Yes. Just that, that sec only that section from the, the, piece you mean, yeah. from the Phillip Street Bridge up to the where the next path, yeah. pathway crosses it at the top of the domain. Yeah, I was just thinking as you were speaking, I mean, with so many big irrigation pipes now in this district carrying water, it made sense to me that we could perhaps, if we could pipe it, would be a solution. Yeah, I, I don't know what the flow is, but the coming in there, where, where the stock water, where the water that used to flow down Harrison Street and that that fed it was piped, it wasn't a very large pipe. 
so to to cap I, I don't know I, I'm not, I guess the maybe something of the order of a 600 or a 750 pipe might not even need to be that big you'd probably carry with the flow there reasonably easily thank you further questions councillors thank you I, I guess the, the the other thing that we did mention is was the the pavilion upgrades and and the long term status of that and we briefly talked about it and I guess it's it's um I'm not sure it's directly related to this domain development plan but you know the long term future of the sport on the domain and in terms of with the EA centre and and all of those things is is a um a, a, a factor an issue or a part of the thing. I don't know that there's some there's in the long in the district long term plan there was some discussion around moving some sports or potentially moving them. If I can be cheeky enough, why don't you now go straight out and ask us if that can be clarified in the fu near future. Um, could you clarify that please? Thank you. <laughs> um, Councillor McMillan. Thank you and I was just going to ask, did we find out who actually owned the pavilion in the end? We did? We did. Okay. Chief Executive. Uh, it is owned by a trust uh, who are in the process of discussing with us uh, a transfer to the council. That's my understanding. Did you hear that, Mike? Yeah. So, obviously, further discussion to take place with the council. Yeah, well, I, yeah. It was probably a couple of years ago, at least, I think that meeting was. It had rang a couple of times since, but there hasn't been a lot of um, a lot of movement. Uh, and it, yeah, as I said before, I think it was something to do with the dissolution of the trust and the way the trust document was worded. Further questions, councillors? Thank you very much to um, the Canterbury Cricket Association for coming in and making your views known. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I now call forward um, Cancer Society of New Zealand, Mandy Casey, and the next one after that is Smoke Free, Mid Canterbury, Crowley, McDowell, and Mandy Casey. So, does one come forward, or does both come forward, or are they separate? Or, Mandy, can I leave it in your hands to tell us what you're doing, please? <laughs> now the page is page. Um, 251 for the Cancer Society and Smoke Free Mid Canterbury is 243 councillors for your reference. I oh, know, press the right hand side and Thank be you. about this far away. Very high tech. Um, my name is Mandy Casey and I'm here on behalf of the Cancer Society. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Carly McDowell and I am a health promoter for community and public health here in the city. Um, thanks for Lisa for having us today, um, giving us the opportunity to present on the um, domain development plan. Um, firstly, we'd like to play a wee clip for you. Uh, to excuse me, um, Carly. Can you please get the microphone sort of lined up like this? Is that <laughs> far away? Sorry. Please. Peter? Yep. We do want to right. hear we do want to hear you and there are people on the web out on the right. computer. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so we'd like to play a clip firstly to remind you of how far we've come in New Zealand and why we are so passionate about making changes for the better in our community. Well, we've known each other for 
the mic at the top of the mic. I wonder...